reactants, especially in a light water reactor, very large forgings, there's really only one contender right now, and that's in Japan, that can make those large forgings. And so as we look at going forward with GNAP, do we have the infrastructure in the United States to build it? For the reactor vessel, we could start literally tomorrow because part of the documentation that the ALMR team made was a book about 400 pages long that lists the 245 tools you got to buy and lists the sequential steps on how to fabricate this reactor vessel. Where'd they learn that from? From the Clinch River Breeder Reactor Project. So all the lessons learned in fabricating the reactor vessel for Clinch River, which they did make, are incorporated into this prism reactor design. And it's a, you know, your assembly book. Read the directions definitely on this one. You can make a reactor vessel. This is a top view of the reactor. These round circles over here are the electromagnetic pumps. These kidney-shaped things are the intermediate heat exchangers. And then you see different instrumentation and control rods. And this is a plug that goes around so you can refuel the reactor. This is kind of a cutaway of the system. You can see the reactor vessel here, the intermediate heat exchanger. Pumps the water into, or pumps the sodium, into the top of this steam generator. This steam generator is a helical coil steam generator which means that the water comes in the bottom and follows this torturous path all the way up the top and goes out. Because of the temperature of the sodium and the pressure of the water, we end up making superheated steam. Superheated steam is good because you get a better steam cycle efficiency. And that goes over to your turbine, makes electricity, comes back around, and then you have the condensate going back to the bottom of the steam generator. And this steam generator design really came from three lessons learned from the Clinch River Breeder Reactor Project. Clinch River looked at using a hockey stick sort of design, looked at a double-walled steam generator, and then a helical coil. Those steam generators were built. They were tested at a facility in California called ETEC, Engineering Technology Engineering Center, where they had these large facilities, these large buildings, and they actually flowed. And out of all of the different steam generator designs, GE picked the helical coil steam generator, Chuck Boardman, because they felt it had the best maneuverability, easiest fabrication, and the least cost. That facility today at California is being torn down. General Electric has the world's largest electromagnetic pump, and we're in the process to see if we can save that pump to do an autopsy on it to see how the materials, the insulation, um, all those things held up during the testing. Because when the program was canceled, Nobody went back to retrieve the pump. And now that we have this new interest, we're trying to get that pump back. Here's one of the things when the GE team started looking at fast reactors, and this is one of the questions that I got uh, before the talk started, what are, what are the economics? So one of the things they looked at was the light water reactors, and you see that there are a lot of redundant and active systems. And what they wanted to do was try to cut those out. So one of the things they did was a passive removal of heat, and so if we start up here at the top, the air comes in to the top of the containment structure, flows down in the silo by a guard vessel, removes the heat, goes up the stack and out. This is always online. You are losing about a half a megawatt of thermal power all the time. Now, when we talk as nuclear engineers to the public about transparent safety, how do you do that? How do you communicate that a reactor is safe? This system, you could put a little twirly wheel up on top here like you wear on your hats and it goes around so that anybody that looks across the fence could see that that thing is twirling. That system can reject the heat. It's passive. It's always online. And some of the analysis that was done on PRISM with the control rods full, fully removed, reactor pump stop, loss of secondary heat removal, you still will not get in a situation where you melt the fuel. That's the sort of things we as nuclear engineers need to communicate to the public about transparent safety and the ruggedness of this design. And it turns out those designs then, we call passive safety, got picked up by the light water reactor community with the generation three sort of reactors. So it was really the fast reactor guys that led the way on passive safety that the light water reactor community then started picking up. Another thing they did on technical design was seismic isolation. These are bearings that you can see in the bottom of the slide here. They're rubber, metal, Composites stuck together. Um, these devices have been placed in buildings in Japan and in, in California, and so there's some good um, data to use those to build that for the reactor. 
uh, one of the things that people talk about with a sodium fast reactor, because the control rods have so much worth, you really have to be cautious of the of the vibrations of the control rods. And so this is a, a concept where you poured the reactor, the two reactor vessels and the steam generator all on one seismically isolated pad. This is some of the analysis that was done based on that design as far as an earthquake, what would happen to the reactor system. Um, this is an old slide, and I, but it shows you the depth of analysis that people have done. This is kind of a cutaway view. Um, if you look at this big picture, this is the reactor vessel. This is the containment structure. And then this is the steam generator over on this side. One of the unique things about this containment system is when they got the license back, initially when they submitted the license to the NRC, they didn't build a containment. They put it in. And what do you think the NRC said on that one? We wanted a containment. Similar to, I see the picture you have of Andy Kadak with the gas reactor. Those guys initially came, you know, we don't need the containment because we have this, we have the containment in the fuel, it's not going to fail. In the process from 1987 to when they issued the new reg 1368 in 1994, they wanted a containment. So the GE engineers went back, they put a soup pot on top of the reactor vessel dome, we got a containment, give us our new reg. But it wasn't as economic as they thought. So Chuck Borman was part of the team that came up with this different design. So it's kind of a square box. And it shares with the other reactor vessel with the rupture disk. So if you have a sodium fire or overpressure event, then you rupture, the pressure gets too high, then you rupture into the next containment or the void space above the next reactor, and it decreases the pressure. So you don't have to build quite as rugged or as thick a uh, reactor containment, but you still add the protection for the worst case sort of accident. This is what it, the Advanced Liquid Metal Reactor Program commercial plant, if you will. This generates 866 megawatts electric. So at the bottom here you see you have three power blocks, and each power block consists of two reactors, one, two, three, four, five, six, and those generate steam, which goes into the turbine hull, which rejects heat through these towers, which goes to the switchyard and gives out electricity. To run this particular plant, it has a fuel fabrication center that takes spent nuclear fuel in, divides it up using electro or pyro processing, electrochemistry, similar to what's done down the road at Alcoa, where you put in electricity in a salt with aluminum or alumina, and you get aluminum. And this facility, once it's at steady state, needs about 50 tons per year of spent nuclear fuel to keep it running and to make electricity. And one of the questions that I got from the web page was, the prison project appears grossly similar to the integral fast reactor, which seemed like a promising project in many ways. So that first sentence, the grossly part is it's exactly the same. The integral fast reactor was Argonne National Labs thing because of political politics. They wanted their own branding on it. The commercial side was called the Advanced Liquid Metal Reactor Program. They are exactly the same, not grossly same. And the other question was, some of us believe the IFR was not commercially adopted because there was no profitable business model for commercial fabrication. How is the prism different from the IFR in regard to commercial fuel fabrication? The IFR and ALMR are the same as far as economics. The GE team, along with Burns and Rowe and, the, and the, all the people that we had with us at the time, we felt it was a very economic way to do. And this particular park would put electricity on the grid at the same price as the, the capital cost for this facility was on the order of 12 to 1,500 megawatts per, or $1,500 per kilowatt. And the bus bar costs were on the order of four to six cents per kilowatt on the grid. This was an nth of a kind plant. And N was defined as you needed to have built about 17 reactor vessels or 17 reactors to give you an order of magnitude. So I hope that answers that question. Uh, the scale in this picture is, I think it's 300 feet. 300 feet by, I think that's the longest dimension by about 200 feet. So it's not, it's not too big. One of the things about capacity factors, if you had six 
reactor vessel is running, your capacity factor should be more than a monolith. Um, here gives you some of the Clinch River breeder reactor, kind of 300 megawatts. And Chuck Boardman said we're a lot more simpler here with the prism reactor. We've cut a lot of components to make it very elegantly or a lot simpler. Any questions on prism before we go? Sorry. Okay, the question is how, what is the breeding ratio for the prism reactor? No, no, it's uh, uh, argon and others are studying the, a variation of the prism reactor with conversion ratios of like 0.5 or lower in order to increase plutonium burn, the oxide burn. And what do you know about how that impacts the patient reactor physics? For the prism reactor, our conversion ratio is 0 0.8. And the reason why we won't go lower is because we think it, it will impact the safety of the reactor. And it also affects the economics because you have to refuel more. And you need to understand that initially when the advanced liquid metal reactor project was started, it was because of the breeder project. And so initially the reactor core prism was designed to be a breeder at about 1.3. Then as the political winds changed from 1985, because we had problems with Yucca Mountain in 1990, then it became this actinide burner. And they looked at how low they could go in the burn ratio, and they found that 0 0.8 was the most optimum point to stop for economics and safety reasons. So we are not proponents of a, of a, a burn ratio or a breed ratio of 0 0.25. I think that's a little bit too aggressive. Yes, sir. The question is, does the prism reactor have a positive Boyd coefficient? And the answer is yes. It does have a positive Boyd coefficient. And that was addressed by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission when we initially submitted it. And there's, we have, we still think we have a, a safer reactor with, even with a positive Boyd coefficient. It's still a beer can, yeah. So we still have a positive void coefficient. Jeff, anything from the back? No? Okay. Still awake? Just checking. All right, let's talk about GNEP. In, uh, I had the opportunity, as I was introduced, to be in Washington, D.C. from in 2005. Um, the American Nuclear Society, hopefully you're all members of it, it has a program where they have congressional fellows. And that's where you go to Washington, D.C., and you spend a year um, with a particular member of Congress. The way that program works is the American Nuclear Society is a part of the AAAS, which stands for the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences. So mechanical engineers and metallurgical engineers and psych the Psychology Society of America, soft science, but they're still scientists, and other Scientists all contribute to this organization, and particularly have fellows. So you have a class of about 120 fellows, predominantly all PhDs, predominantly below the age of 30, that show up in Washington, D.C. in September. AAAS is very well connected, and you go through a two-week orientation where you go to the State Department, to the White House, all these different places on Congress, and you learn how the government works 